Hello everybody, welcome to Training Without Conflict podcast. Today we have a very special guest, Larry Kron. I'm sure most of you should know him by now. He has a book, he's been training dogs for quite some time. He has a very popular book called Everything You Need to Know About E-Collar Training. He has a YouTube channel and a very, very good um, incredible actually social media presence very active at the moment uh, many followers um, so for those of you that don't know the reason we started this uh, we decided to have this specific podcast with Larry um, I'm sure we're gonna have another one at some point on some other topics probably but this specific topic the way it came about was uh, because of a post that I did on social media and I had some questions about the working level the lost team training with electric color and I did say that to me that's a nonsense training and apparently blew the internet um, many people suggested that Larry can be somebody that can uh, talk about it and defend the, 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 the that approach so of course me and Larry know each other for quite some time and but this is the first time we will talk about this so Larry anything else I mean at the end I'm gonna of course introduce for everybody else all of your media links and everything how people can get a hold of you but uh, still you know like I, I'm sure I have a little bit of an audience that don't necessarily know you that well so just in brief some some background well I've been training dogs about 25 years um, I recently retired as a federal agent so I was doing both for for a very long time I've been uh, I started training dogs about the same time as I became a federal agent 1996 somehow my name has become associated with the e-collar and that was never never my intention you know that that was something that i used to actually uh shy away from and i didn't like it because i didn't want to be known as an e-collar trainer i'm not you know i'm, I'm a dog trainer and i think what had happened was about 13 14 years ago i started working with some e-collar people and I didn't like what I was seeing. I just, I just didn't like it. And let me go back even a little further than that. As a, as a kid, and I still am a hunter, but I used to be a bird hunter growing up. So my only vision of the e-collar was terrible. I hated them. I saw a lot of dogs out in the field doing a lot of screaming and a lot of yelping. And I saw really poorly trained dogs that were going through some bad things with, with the old style e-collars. 40 years ago. So you, you know what that was like. Sounds and okay. so I hated it. I hated it. I, I swore I would never use an e-collar on a dog. And then somewhere in the early 2000s, I think it was when the internet started showing up and people started making videos, I saw a lot of the e-collar stuff and it looked a lot different from what I remember as a kid. So I became a little interested and I started working with some e-collar trainers and I won't use any names or anything in this. And it was a very different approach than it used to be. But after going along with that type of system, a very pressure based system, I still didn't like it. And I knew there was a much better way. Okay. Prior to that, I was training with a leash and a flat collar. I didn't use food. I didn't use e-collars. Uh, when I started using e-collars in that manner, there was still no food involved, but it was very pressure based. The dogs were on the e-collars forever and you were stimming the dog every time you gave a command. And to me, that just wasn't dog training. I didn't like it. So I broke away from that kind of training. I didn't invent anything. I didn't create anything. I didn't claim to. I didn't put my name on something and say, this is the Larry Crone method. But as we got further along the whole social media thing, there's trainers out there that are much more popular than me, have bigger followings than me. 
And I just saw them doing so much harm with the tool, destroying dog after dog. I mean, and I would get a lot of these dogs as a lot of people would. And so 13, 14 years ago is when I made my first video describing how I use the e-collar. Again, I didn't create it. I didn't invent nothing. But I just wanted people to have options, to have a different way to get away from the pressure and the punishment of what the e-collar was known to do. And over the last 13, 14 years, it just grew into something much bigger than I than I ever, ever expected. So when I put that book out four, four years, actually, I think it was four years ago to the day. I mean, literally this week is the four year anniversary. My whole goal, Ivan, stuff I put in that book is very basic, very simple. And all it was was stuff that I was already giving my clients and mm -hmm. people were asking me to package it. So when I released that book, my whole goal was that if a few people read it, hopefully they'll stop destroying their dogs. That was it. That was it. <laughs> Four years later, it's still doing very well all over the world. And, you know, the messages I receive on a daily basis, I've, I've been messaged tens of thousands of times on how this has helped people. This was never a thing for me to have financial gains or to you know, become some popular YouTube guy because of e-collar training. I wanted people to stop turning to the people out there that are just hammering dogs and we're still seeing it. And so when you made the post last week, I had no intentions on replying. I stay, I didn't want to stay out of it. I get myself in enough hot water. Okay. And so I started following the thread and I kept saying to myself, please don't let my name pop up. Please don't let my name pop up. I didn't want it. And then my name popped up and it started getting ugly. So I said, okay, I'll talk to you about it because I, I know you guys don't like the way I train. I know you don't like the way I use the e-collar. I see the references. I know a lot of them are geared towards me. There's nothing I could do about that, but I can tell you this. Of course, I respect you a ton as a trainer. I'm not you. I don't claim to be you. Nothing like that. And I'm my biggest critic. But if there's one thing that I have been able to accomplish is I definitely have been able to turn the minds of a lot of people who saw this tool as something really awful. And I think I have had a little success in that area. And if you have a better way, I'm always open, always open to, to make things better because in the end, I don't care about popularity. I don't care about money. I don't care about my business. Okay. I just want to provide whatever is best for the dogs. It's that simple. Yeah. Yeah. I, so like I, I have no, even the slightest doubt in my mind that your heart and your intentions are in the right direction. There's no like absolutely zero doubt there. Um, the, the, the conversation that we're gonna have, hopefully, you know, it, it's not, uh, again, like even, even on the podcast, it wasn't necessarily to, to point to one person, but of course, um, you know, I mean, having, having the book, it, it, I think it was not a surprise that your name came up, I don't think. Sure. Um, you know, there was a surprise. There is, uh, uh, and you can, I don't know. Uh, I mean, you probably know your statistics, but I'm sure the books has sold in, in more than 20, 50, who knows how many thousands copies, right? I mean, it's a, it's a quite a popular book. Um, and as you said, many people un, uh, know the book. Um, so we, <laughs> I guess where where what I'm thinking is because this is this is like the obviously I am I am very loud as far as when I don't like something or when I don't understand something um and in this situation when we talk like I there again on the other hand I don't I absolutely agree with you there is people that should be not training dogs, not, not training dogs with electric cars. There's just people should not be training dogs. 
but they are, you know, they they have successful businesses and good marketing and yeah, unfortunately dogs and clients, pet owners suffer a great deal from it. So on that spectrum, I am again um, agreeing with you, but I, I really must be probably one of the few people that don't understand the magic of low steam and the working level. And so since you, and I kind of, I mean, I have your book here and I've made a bunch of notes that I want to go over certain things, but to, to start somewhere, um, what, uh, like, like uh, we, we, yeah, I'm familiar of course with many versions of that approach but for us to be able to have the conversation I need to understand your take on it so I'm gonna ask some questions so we can have some baseline to start with so uh, uh, you, you prefer to use low stim on the color is that to compensate for the harsh training that you've seen around like or is it because it's actually really working so much better like what how how did the lost team came about uh years ago when i started with the e-collar people i'm, I'm referring to right it was very pressure based mm -hmm. and what i noticed was i mean it was real common even though i was never a heavy-handed trainer even with the e-collar when it was all pressure based but even using low level stimulation, but right from the start with nothing positive involved with the dog and pressure from the e-collar. Every time you gave a command, dogs would look like crap. And sometimes for several days, even strong dogs, they showed a confusion and a sadness and a suppression that I just hated. And that was common. And even though some of the people would say, give it three or four days and they'll start changing it. And often they, the dogs would start coming around, but they had to figure things out. But in reality, the dog was never given an opportunity to win. For the rest of their life, the e-collar was there and you were stimming whenever you told the dog to do anything. Okay. And, and to me, that, that just wasn't an option because you rarely see my dogs with e-collars on. I don't use e-collars a lot. But in the beginning, when I saw a few other people using low level, level stim, and once I started using more food and training, more positive reinforcement, what I saw right away was that suppression or that confusion from the dogs in the beginning, it wasn't there anymore. Instantly, the dogs were looking okay. All right. Because of the low level. Yes. So, of course, it's they're, they're, the dogs, there's still a confusion there. The dog doesn't know what that very foreign sensation is, right? If if we give the dog a leash pop, we push against the dog, we use our, but these are all things that the dog understands. It makes sense. But when a dog feels that very strange stimulation, they don't know what that means. It's completely foreign to them. But what I saw from others, again, I didn't invent this. When you help them with the leash and you paired it with positive reinforcement and you used it with the obedience that the dog knew very well, the learning of understanding what the low level stim was very, very powerful. Now, for me, I like to spend a couple of weeks teaching what the e-collar e stim means to the dog. So the dog understands it inside and out. And, and maybe you don't understand this either from my side, Ivan. Once we get to that point, my whole goal with every single client that I work with is that in the end, the dog responds to the verbal command with no tools on. That's always the goal. And so we get to a point after a few weeks of training and teaching where we're no longer stimming the dog before a command. The e-collar is there if the dog is off leash in public when needed, just in case needed. 
Can people use it for obedience to make things better and faster? Sure, but it's not something that I do much of. I just, I just don't, you know? My whole purpose is that the average dog owner can get their dog and go to the park or go on a hike and provide a little bit of freedom without the dog being attached to a leash, okay? So giving that stim, that low-level stim before a command is only that first week or two or three when we're teaching. I no longer do that once the dog is trained and understands it. Does that make sense? Um, I mean, I, I think I am following. I think I'm following. Um, I guess the question, the first question that I have will be, what is the what is the end goal? What is the objective of all that training? Where, where is that going? Perfect. Good, good, good question. So the end goal is that when you have to turn to higher aversives with the e-collar, when your dog's off leash, it's chasing a deer, it's running to the road, anything. Mm -hmm. And that dog is hit with a high level stimulation, which a lot of people think I'm against or don't do. That's not true. I just like the dog to be trained fairly and prepared for that moment because what happens when that dog does feel high stimulation when needed there's never any negative blowback there's no confusion okay it's just an understanding that we prepare the dog for we prepare the dog how to take that correction because and, and i'm sure you've seen this plenty of times when we're working with these dogs that weren't trained this way where it's just compulsion and punishment, there's a lot of suspicious behaviors created from the dog. You don't know what to expect. So when someone throws an e-collar on a dog for the first time and they take it off leash, which people still do, and the dog doesn't come back and they nail it on a high level, the dog doesn't know what that is. He doesn't know how to respond properly. Some people may get lucky and the may, dog may turn around and not leave your side, you know, but I have a dog here now that went through some, you know, I don't know what happened, right. but when the dog saw an e-collar, it ran back in my house and hid it in its pen, you know? And, and so the end goal, my objective is that when the aversive is need to be used, because in the end, the e-collar is just there if needed, the dog knows how to respond properly without having any negative blowback. That's it. I'm very simple and basic. So, and what is the, okay. So, without having a blowback what would that be if if it was to have one you don't know how the dog's going to respond you could freak it out the dog could become okay I'll give you an example so so we don't we don't so the one at least one of the end goals then for you is and it, correct me if it's not right but one of your end goal is that whenever time comes and you're saying most likely time will come that you will need strong higher aversive stronger intensity on the collar so the dog doesn't become uh fearful from the collar that's one one yes that's definitely one thing sure okay what other you said that there is no confusion the dog understands what just happened. So like when you say no confusion, that would be no confusion towards, oh, I know what that feels like, or, oh, I know, like, like what, what confusion exactly are you referring to? All right, give you an example. We're working with a big, strong Malinois that went through some bad e training, right? Recently, in front of a lot of people at a seminar, this dog was having a problem with the out. Wouldn't release anything. Now when the owner or anybody tries to get the dog out, as soon as the dog hears the word out, it's going to turn and nail the owner. One of the very popular trainers out there to teach the dog how to out, had the owner give a bite or whatever they did, told the dog to out when it didn't, blasted it on the highest level on the e-collar. No training. Okay, what does the dog do? Doesn't know what to do. Turns and nails the owner. 
Now, every time the dog hears out, it's waiting for that big ass kicking. There was no education there, right? 100% unfair to the dog, 100%. When we worked with that dog, that dog never once went after me or another handler when we were working on the out. And we spent very limited time. A, a, a seminar is not the best place to reintroduce the dog to the e-collar. But the second we reintroduced these dogs to the low level stem paired with something the dog loves. And we, we do it at police seminars. We do it police canines. They change very, very quickly. We provide a different picture, a more fair picture to the dog. It's just clear to the dog. It's opposite of what we were doing 20 years ago, 30 years ago. Okay. Okay. Um, <clears throat> so, so from, from that example, like the first one we said is that when, when we hit higher intensity, the dog doesn't freak out. And from the example that you just gave me, what would be the second benefit of the low the working level the low stem the example the the benefit of the low stem say in the malinois example the only benefit of the low stem was we showed the dog a different picture he understood it he understood how to remove the stimulation and better his situation how to receive something he wanted okay, okay? so before instead of you know saying out and then blasting the dog and the dog biting harder and nailing someone now we spend half the day, you know, a few minutes here, a few minutes there, introducing the low level stems. When the dog responds to the command, marking it rewarding. Now the dog sees a different picture. Right, right. So I, I mean, I, I know we, we will have examples, but I also have to try to extract whatever we need to extract from every example and kind of put them uh, to where they make sense. So. Um, from, from that example with the out, with the Malinois, basically, again, the first one we said the dog is, can handle low intensity without being afraid. That's the one objective. Second objective is when you, we extract that objective without going through the example of how the dog worked and how it solved it, but what we actually taught him, what we, what were we supposed to accomplish? So what is the, the uh, benefit of the low steam in that example, without giving the example, just, I'm just looking for the phrase. The, the, the benefit is the dog learns how to remove the stimulation without confusion. 100% understands how to remove the stimulation, okay? Now, a couple of weeks into it, when we do start adding in corrections for noncompliance, again, there's clarity there on the dog's end where yeah, he completely no, understands it. Yeah, yeah, we're definitely gonna go in, in a detail. I'm just trying to really get the, like, again, for somebody like me, I, I'm probably a little too particular with wording, but. Um, I, um, I find it very beneficial when we discuss anything. And, and when we start doing something, it's always good to know why we're doing it. What are the benefits? And so one of the benefit of low steam for right now is the, not, not to freak out as much. Another way, uh, one is understanding how to shut it off. And, and and not submit, not crumble the dog, right? What else would you think are the, the benefits of, of that approach? I mean, not that they, they have to be any. I mean, that's sure, just two by sure. itself are a lot, but I don't wanna make you think that I'm, you know, if there is, there is. That's that's the really the, the, the main gist of things. I, I wanna provide a very clear understanding to the dog on on what that stimulation means how to remove it how to turn it off okay perfect so we accomplish this in few different ways and and from 
from the book and from the YouTube channel and, and just, you know, from what I know, like, like for example, the book starts with conditioning phase, use the color with every command, reward every time, train with as little distraction as possible, keep session 15 minutes or so, you know, short session. Um, so let's go over that conditioning phase. Like, sure. And and we assume we have so uh, we just just for the sake of time, let's say if we if we need to do some preliminary work with the leash, we don't need to be in great detail, but but whatever whatever we need to do. Sure. Okay. So when a dog comes to me, I'm never putting an e collar on and starting to train the dog. Okay. That that just doesn't happen. The dog's going to be trained on a leash and a flat collar. That's it. Okay. I'm going to build some kind of trust with that dog. I'm going to take a good amount of time to where the, the dog's fine with me. He trusts me. We have a little bit of a relationship there and I work the basics on a, on a leash, whether it's a six foot leash, a 10 foot leash, a 15 foot leash, that's it. When I finally put that e-collar on that dog, he's going to have a good understanding of the basics. So when we start the e-collar work, say with a recall or a go away on, onto a place, he understands those commands very well. That's it. And it's all done on leash. So when the dog doesn't respond in the beginning, if a dog has a hard time, the leash is there to help the dog. I'm not going up in higher levels. I'm not correcting the dog with the e-collar. I'm not putting more pressure on the dog. You know, that's okay. not going to happen until later on into the process. So we have a, you have a dog and you teach him sit down, heel, place, like what, what, what are we teaching? Sure. The, the, the basics okay. come to me, go away from me on a place. Okay. And, and, and I'm not, I'm and, not utilizing uh, that e-collar with even a, a down and a sit usually in okay. the beginning. And what does determine when you will start? When the dog is responding well to the verbal commands on leash. What does that mean well to you? When you say respond well? Every time, well. for the most part, every time. So you give a command place and the dog goes right away. Sure, and, and I, I don't need perfection from 50 feet away, okay? okay? Just to understand the basics of the command because once the e-collar is implemented there, I'm not turning on an e-collar from 50 feet away and wait until the dog gets there. Okay, I'm not no, doing man. that. Okay, Th that's gonna that's gonna take us too far up out in the conversation. Uh, um, so you have trained the dog to have some basic understanding of the commands, and if we say basic understanding, because I I keep saying like I almost every time when we have a podcast I do that, like if. Right now, you and I have to draw a, a dog. We both will, but if we once pick up the sheet and show it to each other, chances are they're gonna look different. And that will be with 50 people as well. Like we all have a picture of something, but when we actually put it in work, we have a different, it comes out different. So. So when we're talking about basic understanding of commands, that's why I'm not like really challenging that. I'm just trying to get to understanding what would that mean so we agree on it. So the question when we talk about basic commands would be after, when, when they meet your satisfaction, does that mean that the dog now doesn't need any help, any prompts from you when you give the commands? Sure. Right. I call the dog. He turns and comes to me. I ask the dog to go to a place. He turns and he goes to the place. That's it. Uh, the dog's responding okay. without me okay. helping him with the leash, without me luring okay. him. The other one was, you said, um, like out of 10 times, he does it. You said every time, but then you kind of said, so what, like out of 10 times, what would be the criteria? for you to understand that the dog, no, you, it's enough for you to say, I'm, I'm happy with this, we move on. Well, I prefer 10 out of 10 times, but I'm doing this in very stagnant areas without distractions. So it's easy to achieve that. You understand what I'm saying? What else do we need as a prerequisites 
before we start electric oil. Well, that's kind of where we are. I mean, as far as meeting the foundation in the basic commands. Every dog is different. I don't have a, a set timeline. I kind of let the dog dictate that. Um, I've had a dog here now for almost a month. There's no e-collar training because this dog has, has so many problems. It just wouldn't be beneficial at this time. So from this point, you say that you will go, let's say the, the, the basics are there and there are no distractions. What is the, what, what comes to mind that you say now, now it's time to introduce the color? Right from the start, you mean in the beginning? No, no, like you, you're doing your basic obedience and you have not used the electric collar whatsoever. And all of a sudden now, preferably 10 out of 10 times in a quiet environment, the dog understands the commands without help. And now we start teaching him the conditioning phase, as you call it. So describe the conditioning phase. When the dog is showing me that it's doing well where we're at, and I'm basically doing the same things over and over. The dog's not shut down. Right, right. We said that. Yeah, we, I mean, it meets the basic obedience criteria that I just said. When, when, when the e-collar stuff starts, just like you explained in the beginning, I'm starting with the recall almost always, unless there's a reason why I can't, right? The low, I'm going to find the dog's lowest level that the dog feels something. I'm going to turn it on. I'm going to ask the dog to come to me when it comes. I'm turning the e-collar off. I'm marking that and I'm rewarding that. And I'm doing a lot of repetitions with that. Okay. Okay. So just so we, I mean, for some people, and then these are important uh, details, you, you have two approaches and you kind of use sometimes this or this. And one of them is the dog receives a steam before you say anything to the dog and then you say and then what happens then the dog's reaction compliance to the command removes the stimulation and produces the reward marker okay. which produces the reward and in the other option because you, you say that there are two on the other option you first give the command and then apply the low steam and then the reward. Sure, yeah, and, and I don't do that as much anymore. Um, if the dogs, I usually wait more for the intermittent phase to start doing that. So in the beginning, mostly it's before the command. So, so the dog is whatever, 10 feet, 20 feet away from you, right? And, and you use a low stem. What, uh, what are you? hoping how do you want the dog to perceive that low steam as in the beginning he's going to perceive it as he doesn't know what the hell that is doesn't know right mm -hmm. total confusion that's why the leash stays on we're there to help the dog so if the dog does not turn on its own to recall if the stimulation creates enough confusion to stop the dog we give very light leash pressure to help the dog guide us in the right direction. Okay. Okay. The dog takes one step my way. I'm not waiting for the dog to get to me to remove the stimulation. The second the dog turns to come my way, that's where the stimulation turns off and I'm marking that right there. That's why where a lot of people fail, that reward marker means nothing to the dog. Okay. But what I explained to them is that reward marker will benefit the dog when that e-collar goes away and that should build speed in the command. So when you use that stimulation before the command, what does the dog feel? Uh, we say that it's confusion. We say that he doesn't know what it is, but is it neutral? Is it is it unpleasant or is it pleasant? The people that say the dog loves the stimulation, they don't understand it. No dog loves e-collar stimulation. I don't care how low it is, okay? So my goal for the dog is to keep it as neutral as possible, okay? 
That's the goal. Keep it as neutral as possible in the beginning. So if you use it as as with the with the intention that the dog like like if I if it's neutral to me basically would be something that it doesn't matter to me, correct? Sure. So there is no there is no it's not aversive it's not pleasant but it's neutral so like uh if you give me an example on on what would i feel like forget we we can never ask i wish we can ask dogs so many questions but unfortunately we cannot but but let's say you put it on yourself or you put it on me and you say hey this is the neutral how how the neutral feels like where you could barely feel it on your skin you feel it it's there it's there's no discomfort there's no pleasure you just feel it how certain can you be that that's where the dog is at because we are looking we are looking we're looking for some uh body language signs right or no um some right. kind of indication it could be extremely subtle right there could be no indication whatsoever. Um, that comes with experience. A lot of people look for, you know, something very obvious where the dog turns around and looks at them. But, but, but often at that time, it's a little higher than needs to be in the beginning. You know, these dogs feel it on very, very low levels, lower than most people assume. So we are applying <clears throat> low steam or whatever level of steam, depending on the dog, but the idea is to stay neutral. So the dog says, I'm feeling something, but it doesn't matter either way. Sure. Yeah? Sure. And then we call the dog. As the dog starts to head our way, we turn it off. It comes, it gets reboarded. How many times we do that? What are we looking for? Like typically, like in your book, for example, you say, we do that for a couple of weeks or something like that. For me, myself, I do that a couple of days with the dog. Two days, maybe three days, depending on the dog. So when you say depending on a dog, what does that mean to you? Depending how the dog's responding, how it's learning, what, what kind of dog it is. Right. So what kind of respond? Like, you know, like, for example, if I teach a dog to come, if I do it, I know if uh, uh, where where the dog is and i know when it's time to go to the next stage if there is next stage in the process i want to see certain criteria met so just depends on the dog is that one phrase that everybody says and it's one of the most vague escape answers so you have a dog, you're, you're going through the, that first conditioning phase, neutral, before the word, then the word, then release. And you're doing this for a few days. What determines when it's time to go to the next stage, which you call the intermittent phase? When the dog is at the end of a long leash and he's not paying attention to me, and I could just tap the button, tap, tap, and he turns and comes to me without a command. That's when I know I can move on. That's when the dog's starting to understand what's expected. So, uh, I'm just running this one in my mind here. So when you, you, you're looking for the response that the dog is out, you tap, tap, still on that neutral level and before you say the command the dog is already coming to you 100 percent. yes that's what i want okay and what does that accomplish what that accomplishes every client dog that goes home i went want them to be able to have that 
that nonverbal recall with their dog because you have to understand something, Ivan. We're we're working with very average pet dog owners. So you so the accomplish on the 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 objective, at least here, at that moment of the conversation is that you can tap him and you don't need to call him and he comes. Yes. Okay. All right. And. Then what do we do? Cause like, like I'm, I'm going by the book, I'm going by the videos that I've seen and, and trust me, I have seen, I, I have seen all of your videos probably. I mean, that may sound trippy, but I have. Conditioning phase, use the color with every command, reward every time, train with little distractions as possible. So once we, <clears throat> we say that we start with the recall and then which one would be the next one that you would go with as far as commands come to me go away from me to a to a place command so recall and a place mm -hmm. okay and that is already again done the dog has a foundation without the color now we're doing it with the color now it's done at the same we with the same obviously procedure and order we are giving the neutral stim, then we say place, a reward. Yes. Right. What is the end goal here in that command? I don't want the dog to later on in the training, like a lot of people go through, when they feel the e-collar stimulation, they're scared to leave their owner's side. They think when they feel the stimulation, that means stay next to me and don't move. So the end goal is what to you? That the dog pays attention to the verbal command and understands that the e-collar stimulation mm -hmm. just doesn't mean stick at my side and be scared to move, okay? Learns to go away <laughs> from me as well as it learns to come to me. Okay, so we have a, I, I have a, something that's contradicting here for me that we need to. Let me say this, again, the end goal is I want the dog to understand how to remove the stimulation. Mm -hmm. That's it. It's that, it's that simple. So, so at least on the conditioning phase with the recall, the idea was to do the low steam neutral and the dog turns and comes to you without the command. Mm hmm on going away from you, doing place. The steam comes first, it's neutral, the command comes next, the dog gets rewarded. What are you, how, how do you move forward from there? So we said on the recall, the idea is that you steam and you know when the dog is ready for the intermittent stage because you, at this point, you don't give the command and he goes to you. Yeah, yeah. So what are you looking clearly? What are you looking when you teach the dog to go away? And you, when, what, what, what is the deciding factor to move to the intermittent stage? I'm not using the place command as a deciding factor. I'm using the, the dog's ability to learn that nonverbal recall to know when to move forward. If the dog does that without the command, and that's what I want. When there's no command, I want the dog coming to me. That's what I teach every client dog, right, every right, right. dog owner. Yeah. Okay. So I'm not worried. If he does that, then I know he understands how to turn it off going to a place or a sit or a down. That's all I care about at that stage. Okay. But yet that does not answer my question. But that's, that's the best I can answer it. I don't know how, it's, how to answer that. All right, that's going to be bad if you don't know how to answer it. Because I like right now, I don't know what criteria you're trying to meet to say now I can go to the intermittent stage. Like you very nicely put it step by step for the recall. I'm asking if you can do that for the place. Okay, yeah, same thing. When the e collar comes on and I say place, I want the dog every time to understand 
that command, which he should know before the e-collar is even implemented, Correct. before we start. Correct. Okay. Correct. But when I give the place command, if the dog is reverting the coming to me or there's confusion, then I didn't do my job. I can't move forward. We have to fix that. So how, how, like, I'll go to how we fix that, but I want to know, I still don't know exactly what you look in the dog, what you will do and what you look in the dog as a response for it to say, we're good at that level. We are ready to move to the next. I'm just looking Let for me the... say one, one more time. On the recall, you've done work without the e-collar. Then you've added the e-collar before the command, then the command, then the reward. Then through some repetition, finally you can use the e-collar as a neutral level and you don't need the command and the dog comes to you. So this is very clear, logical order. I, I want to hear you explaining that same I, 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 with the place. The recall is the only command that I'm doing that with, where I just tap, tap, no command, the dog comes to me. As far as, as far as with the place command, the way I know he's there, and I don't care so much about the place command itself. I know he knows that before we start the e-collar work. I want to know that when the e-collar comes on and I send him to a place, he responds properly every time. That's all I'm looking for. Now, mind you, I'm not doing this from far away. I'm doing this from close. Sure. So I'm, I'm not holding the e-collar and the dog is 50 feet away from the place sure. command. You, you understand what I'm saying? It's sure, all but done. even... <clears throat> sure, sure, absolutely. I, I, I get that. And that's it. I'm just looking for the correct response. That's, that's what I'm trying to get you to give me. That step-by-step -step correct. I do this, the dog does this, I do this, the dog does this, and eventually I do this, or I don't need to do this, and the dog does that. Just like how we explain the recall, can you explain the place? Procedure. I thought I just did. The e-collar comes on, I ask the dog to place, there's no hesitation, he goes to it. Mm -hmm. He goes to it. I remove the stimulation, I mark and reward. That's it. That's the, there is no more, like like you you will remain with a command in that situation. Yes, yes, okay. always. Then you have a sit. What do we do with the sit? No different than the place command. It, it's this. It's a, it's the same thing. I'm using mostly the recall to gauge how much the dog is understanding the simul the stimulation when it's associated with a command. That's that's the the main basis. That's the command that I'm looking for that I need most associated with the recall. Okay, all right. So, so you gotta help me here to for me to clear up some things for myself. We said that in the beginning you don't use the color. We have done a lot of preliminary work. Well, a lot, whatever, enough preliminary work. The dog has the basic understanding of basic commands and then we decide to put the collar on then we start that conditioning phase we teach i mean we don't teach we we use it for the recall we use it for the place we use it for the sit we use it for the down and every time we are using it with all those commands we start prior to the command the dog does the command, but the dog was going to do the command anyway. Correct me if I'm wrong, even yes. if we did a news because of the work that you've done before. Sure. And, and also because the level that you're using is neutral, meaning it does not make the dog happy or frustrated, discomfort or pleasure. There is no, it's just. Sure. Okay. So your question is, why would I use the e-collar no, then? No, 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 we're not there. I mean, ultimately this, the, no. Uh, the question is, where do we, what, what, uh, what determines, like let's say with the, with the recall, there is a very good indication that it's like, okay, 
I, if I tap him and I don't say the command and he knows how to come to me, that means we are ready for the next stage. If you're tapping and still giving the command and the dog goes to place, what are you looking in that sequence, in the response of the dog that tells you the dog is now fluent in this and we're gonna do something more? Here's, here's the thing. As far as being fluent in it, right? I mean, fluent is a loosely word. It's what, what makes you think to go to the next stage? I understand what you're saying. So I'm using the place command in there, but I'm more gauging it off of the recall to go to the next stage, okay? I know if the dog understands the stimulation with the recall, if he's responding properly with that, if he responds without the command for the recall and he's responding to the other basics with the command, then I'm comfortable moving to the next stage. That's just how I do it. I'm comfortable. I know we're ready to move forward. And I normally don't have a problem with it. Okay. So I, I don't want to answer the question for you, but basically I, I still don't know when you will be okay this i've done what is it is it certain number of commands certain days amount of days um like like when when are you okay i've done this that's that's good i've checked in the box i've done place and i've introduced the the dog has the neutral has the place command goes to it gets the reward we've done that when will you be okay i'm good with this now what what are you looking for at that point the most important thing to me is that the dog responds to the recall every time okay but but larry that's that that's what i'm larry, gauging off but that of. that doesn't answer the question i i have for right now at least i have no problem with how we we actually were very methodical of explaining step by step the order of what we are looking and when we are progressing with the recall my problem is not with the recall. I'm asking when we do this work with the place and the caller, how long are you gonna do it for and why? What decides that? I'm doing the, the, the recall, usually by itself in the beginning, sometimes with the place command. Depends how quick the dog is to learn. But I'm not waiting. There's nothing in the place command that's magical that's telling me when it's time to move on. It's just the overall picture of the dog, how it's responding to the e-collar. That's all I care about. If he's responding properly and I'm not having to use the leash all the time to help him, then I'm comfortable moving forward. And properly meaning he, the two things that we said, he's not afraid. Um, I mean, even if he's, well, he's not afraid because it's neutral, right? So there is nothing to be afraid of. And he, he functions through the commands. Sure. Yes. Okay. So from, from so far, what I'm getting is it's a very vague, there, it's not even vague. There is nothing that determines you're not like, I don't think you're looking for anything specific you're just saying okay now we're gonna do place and i'm gonna use the steam neutral before the command to go to place just because or am i missing something i don't i'm not sure what what you're missing i'm trying to think if how i could explain it differently maybe i give you an analogy i give you let's say i teach a dog to sit and i'm gonna use a hot dog and i'll say sit and I'm gonna lure and I'm gonna do this X number of times. Eventually I'm gonna say sit, I'm about to lure and he sits. That will be my first indication that some learning is taking place because the dog starts to anticipate and it's not as reliant on my help anymore. Eventually the command becomes 
much more well understood and the dogs become more fluent. He does not need help. Now I know that that command to me is sufficient at that stage. Now, if I decide to do it in some generalization discrimination stage to where it's like, no, if I say sit on the chair, you sit on the chair. It's not that you sit only in front of me. But also discrimination, if I say pit, you don't sit on it. Or if my friend says sit, you don't sit on it. You said sit when only I do it, then you do, and that there is a stages. But I will not go to that stage unless I have seen understanding in the very first one. So this is the kind of systematic movement that I'm looking for, that I'm trying to get from you. We are introducing, not for the first time, obviously the e collar got introduced on the recall, but now we are using the e collar for place in the same fashion, but there is no end goal. We are just kind of, okay, we're gonna do this five times and, and that's sufficient. That's kind of what I'm concluding from what we've said so far. I think if you're looking at it as using the e-collar to teach or judge the place command, I can understand where you're coming from. The way I'm trying to, to, to look at it, Ivan, the way I do it, is I'm taking a command that the dog knows to help him understand what the stimulation is. Right, I, I get it. But you still don't answer me. When do you know that the dog has understood that? When he's responding properly every time. That's all I'm looking for. That's it, that's all I want. But he's responding properly before you ever put the collar on him, right? Yes. Yes. Okay. So I want those repetitions with the stimulation, preparing the dog for later on when he is off leash. I know he understands it. I'm doing everything now to prepare the dog for later. That's it. I understand that. So it still does not answer a, a simple question. What I think it's simple question. I get it. It prepares the dog for later, but when do you conclude that now the dog is prepared for later? What is the, what is that you're gonna see in the dog that will be different from another stage or, or is there such a thing? Or is it just a number of tries or how, how does that work? I'm just, I, I just want a, a good amount of repetitions. I want the dog to be consistent. I want the dog to be upbeat and responding appropriately. That's it. That's all I want. Okay. So how, how would it be different than without having the collar and having the collar and he's doing plays? It wouldn't be. And he's doing it reliably. It, it, okay, it wouldn't so be. It wouldn't be. So what makes you say that's good enough for me? Now I'm going to work on the seat or I'm going to work on, or I'm going to make it more complicated. I mean, do you use stages? Do you, I mean, you obviously are waiting for some something that the dog shows you, okay, I got this. What, what else do you want to teach me? Right? So from that end, when he's doing that every time, that's when we'll start adding some distractions, making it a little more difficult for the dog. Okay. But that's again, you're telling me what you're going to do, but you're not telling me what is the deciding factor for you to start doing that. I don't, I don't know. I can't answer that. I don't know what else to say about that, Ivan. I've, I've just told you what I go off of, and, and that's the dog's response. But that's the thing you haven't told me because you're not telling me what is the dog's response. It's not different than, like, that response is not different than the response before you did anything with the collar. Sure. Okay. I just want the repetitions with the collar. That's all I want. There we go. There we go. And I want to, and I want to see that it's not affecting anything in a negative way. The dog, the response, the commands. Perfect. I'll go with that. I'll take that any day. That's, that's, that's what I need. So we will do that with the sit as well. You will see, I, I'm not, uh, tr please understand. I'm not trying to be like pain in the ass. Like you, you will see this is super important because 
you know, like like what we are doing, what the intentions, what we are looking for, all this matters in order for us to evolve and, and move on with the training with that dog, right? So we've done the recall, we got that understanding, then we are going by some repetitions just so the dog, it's like, okay, we're gonna do this for five times or maybe three days or whatever. There is no, there is no magic number in that. No. It's just an no. exposure of the, sure. for the dog. It's like, I'm gonna steam neutrally, you go to place. I'm gonna steam neutrally, you do a sit. I'm gonna steam neutrally, you down. I'm gonna steam, sometimes I'm not gonna even call you, you're gonna know that you're gonna come. Correct. And now, now we are going to the next stage, the inter intermittent stage, right? Okay, what, what is the objective of the intermittent stage? That the dog starts, respond, understands it's got to respond whether the e-collar is there or not. This is where sometimes we're utilizing the e-collar, sometimes we're not. Sometimes we're rewarding, sometimes we're not. This is where we start taking the dog, adding real distractions to new places, new things. Okay, so... Sometimes we are using, sometimes we are not. Sometimes, um, but okay. Uh, let me let me think here. So the my question is, in that intermittent stage, what is the role of the electric collar? Because from what I know so far, it's still a neutral. Means nothing one way or another. This this is where we can start adding some aversives. This is where I start adding some aversives. This is where I start adding some corrections if the dog doesn't comply. Okay. So you say place and the dog doesn't go to place. Let's say it confuses it with a done or whatever. It, it doesn't go to place. What do we do? Well, you know, that's a, that's not an exact question because I'm, I'm a little slow on adding any kind of punishment to a dog when they're learning. Okay. So I'm real slow to start punishing the dog with an e-collar if there's confusion there. Do you understand what I'm saying? So in other words, if I ask the dog for a place and now we're making it a little more difficult. So then just, I, I probably that that was wrong of me. So you describe yourself the intermittent stage with the command place. Okay. So if we're working on just the place command in the intermittent stage, right? I may do the same thing we did in the conditioning phase, one repetition. That was with the e-collar, mark and reward, we give food. Okay. The next time I may do the same thing, except now we're not marking and rewarding. Now the dog's holding the position until we release the dog. Free dog, break, okay, whatever you use. The dog's learning how to remain in position. It's not going to get, we're not going to walk around with food the rest of our lives, giving the dog treats, okay? But here we also start using the command without the e-collar. I ask the dog to place, the dog goes to place. We're going to reward. There's going to be times we don't reward. But here, now, if we say place and we know the dog knows it well and we don't get the response we want from the dog, again, I'm very slow to do this. Most are a little quicker to start correcting the dog with the e-collar. I'm not. But in reality, we're going to get to a point where now we can correct the noncompliance with the dog. Okay. And that's going to be a little higher than what the dog learned on when there's no distraction, there's no discomfort. Now we can start adding some of our. Things. So you're, you're in an environment, you're in the same environment, right? You're, you're still, there is not heavy distractions or anything like that. Just in the beginning when we start off. Yes. And does the dog know place just to go in and come out or is it to stay there also? Both. I want them to know, know both. So, but you've taught that you have taught in your basic foundation also the stay there or sure. just yes. you have told the stay. Absolutely. There. So does that mean that you used like, what did you do when the dog did not want to stay there? 
how how did that get resolved? I mean, we know dogs will not want to stay there for no reason there. So. Sure. I, if you're asking me if I'm using the e-collar there, no, I'm not. I'm not punishing that. I'm making sure I teach the dog. Yeah, I understand. I understand that you did not, you start without the e-collar. So what I'm asking is, you tell him place, he goes in a place and he walks out. I tell him, now I bring him back. I right. bring him back. And, and you know, I'm going to keep asking that question because we know that there is that dog that just bringing him back is not going to be enough. Uh, you know, it, it, it depends, Ivan, you know, um, I'm not going to start correcting that with an e-collar right away, but that's just me. No, no, I know. I know. I'm not saying, I'm not trying to trick you to say I'm going to use the e-collar, but you, what do you do? I mean, we, we know this is a, uh, something that will happen and you've dealt with. So how have you dealt with? Sure. It happens all the time. And you, right. if you, if you've seen all the videos, you've seen it, I'll keep working on it until the dog understands it. And I'll give, if I have to give a leash correction when the dog gets off, then that's what I'll do. So you will do leash correction. Sure. Okay. There you go. That's, that's what sure. we need. And, and when we say leash correction, what does that mean to you? Just a quick pop. Boom. No pop back up there. So some, some mind mild discomfort and telling him to go back there. Yeah. Okay. There we go. So now we're going to the same situation. We have reached that same situation with the color, correct? And is that in the intermittent stage or is that later that you're gonna? Yeah. Yeah. You, you could start, you could start adding aversives in that intermittent stage. Sure. Okay. So if he doesn't want to go or gets out or whatever, being a dog, you, well, what is the order? You, you tap him first and you say, or does it matter? It doesn't matter. It doesn't okay. matter. But one way or another, if he's confused, you're telling him go to go back there. Sure. And mm -hmm. you're using obviously a higher level, right? Yeah. Yeah. A little bit higher, a little right, bit higher. Right. So when you say that you use neutral level, you were very specific how skillful you are to create that level that the dog is like, that's not pleasant, but that's definitely also not unpleasant. I'm right in the middle. So what are we looking in the dog now that we're going to actually use it as an aversion in the dog's response? And what is the deciding factor? If we <clears throat> I want it to be very effective on the dog without creating any issues with the dog at the same time. I want the dog to know why he was just corrected, but he's also not scared to make a mistake. Right. So let's say, what kind of collar do you typically, just so we... Uh, E-collar technologies and, and, and Chameleon Martin system collars. All right, so let's say from what one to what level? Uh, the MIDI educator goes from one to a hundred. Okay, so one to a hundred, beautiful. So, so let's say we are on that specific dog for just for the sake of the example, the, his neutral level is seven. Mm -hmm. And now, he decides to do something else, changes his mind for the place. We use an aversion. So where would you go? You have to read that dog, know the dog well. That could be right. a 15, it could right. be a 20. But what, what, right, right, right. Absolutely agree with you. So what are we looking in the dog? Yeah, um, I'm looking to see if the dog has a really poor reaction then I'm too high. What is a poor reaction? Vocalizes, jumps, okay? I don't want none of that. I want the dog to know what just happened and to respond to it and be like, ah, I didn't like that too much, but I don't want to put it over the top. But at the same time, if there's no reaction, then I know I'm too low. Okay. So how, 
how do you find that level? That's a feel you got to have with that particular dog. By time you get to that point, you should know how the dog responds to things. I do. I know I do with every dog I work with. Wow, that that's that would confuse me to say that because um, so far you've been only using the collar on a neutral level. So you don't really know how the dog will respond or and on what level. Not to that first time, no, exactly. Okay, so you're, you're, you're going off what you've done over and over with, with many dogs. So you said the dog works on a seven, which is very average for that collar with most dogs, right? Very, very average. I mean, I just put a number. But it is, that that is like a very accurate average to where the average dog works on that particular collar in mm -hmm. that conditioning phase. And so when we start adding some aversive uh, with that particular collar, then anywhere from a 15 to a 20 is very average, very common for most dogs. And very rarely are you going higher than that, or do you have to go higher than that? Okay. So I, I find it for me problematic that you're spending that much time to find the neutral level and to use it on all these commands to condition the dog to the collar. But then when the time comes to actually use it as an aversion, you, you're pretty much saying that I, I just know now from experience what to do. So how did you not know from experience to find the neutral level. Why were you so methodical on the neutral level, but you're really very much rushing if we are comparing the two introductions? I'm not rushing anything. The thing is with the neutral level in the conditioning phase, it's pretty similar for most dogs. It's very common, very average in the single digits number on that collar. And so when you've done it enough, you know where most dogs are, are feeling. And it's and it's it doesn't vary that much. It really doesn't. Okay. It just doesn't. And there's not a lot of dogs that if you go to a 15 on the collar or 20 on a collar where they've been feeling it over and over for the, the past week or two, where it's going to create such a negative issue it just it just doesn't happen that way the problem is where you go from those neutral levels to popping it to a 70 or an 80 which we still see quite often that's where you run into problems i'm very conservative with the tool is it correct the statement that i'm gonna make you're teaching the dog that the collar is neither pleasant or displeasant for quite some time in that conditioning stage. That's your objective. You're going way out of your way. You're doing it before commands. You're doing it with all commands. You're doing it all over the place with the intention that means neither or. It stays right in the middle, neutral. Mm -hmm. How does that prepare him to handle now the color as something aversive? Because now all of a sudden he's disobeying a command and now he feels something in a discomfort. So how did that, that work prepared him for that event, that preliminary work? I can't tell you with the dog experiences. I just know how they respond and how they behave. And I know how they respond and behave when they feel it as a high level aversive for the first time with no preparation. Okay. Doing it this way, I've never seen a dog respond poorly to a correction from an e-collar, even at higher levels when you do take the time to prepare them. Okay. But that, that's not, so again, my question is how does that low stim, neutral conditioning prepares the dog for that time when he's disobedient and he says, I'm going to get out of place. 
And now all of a sudden, all that preparation, or I mean, all that conditioning saying, hey, you're gonna feel something, but it's neither good or bad. And now it comes as bad. Mm -hmm. We said that there is a benefit. The reason we are doing that conditioning is because we are preparing the dog so he can not fear it, so he can respond correctly, so all those things, right? Sure, sure. So if it's a neutral stimuli, all of a sudden becomes an aversive. How did the neutral prepare you to respond correctly on an aversive? The dog knows what it is. There's no confusion there. How? No, that, no, that's the problem that I have with you right now. The dog doesn't know what it is. What, I mean, the dog knows what it is, but what the dog knows is that it's neutral. That's what the dog knows. That's what you've spent all this time, however long, throughout all the commands. You've gone out of your way to drill it in his mind that this is neither good or bad. How does that prepare him to handle the aversive? Because obviously now we know that the, the aversive is a clearly a, a completely new event. I don't know if you could say it's a new event. I know it's a completely new feel, but at this point, I don't believe it's foreign to the dog, even though it's at a higher level. And the reason I say that is because of the dog's response when no, you no, no, do no. have to go to a higher version. Larry, 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 call, call them, call them. We, we cannot, you cannot say that, I, I, and this is why. If we say that something is neutral to me, and all of a sudden it's unpleasant, that means I don't want it. Neutral means I don't give a fuck. Right. Right. How that prepared me for I don't want it? Well, for one, for me, the dog knows how to avoid it very quickly. No, that's not the question. The question that I have is how what you did for all that time with the electric collar, presenting it as a neutral, prepared the dog. Because ultimately, when we started the conversation and in the book and everywhere else, we're saying that all that big production is done in order to prepare the dog for that event that just came. And my question is, in what way did prepare it? Because he has never up to that point felt the electric as an aversion. Right, right. So this is a totally new event. Sure. So how all that foundation, all that conditioning prepared them for that event because that was your goal. I can't answer that for you scientifically. I could just answer it for you. I could just, the only thing I could do is answer you for the way the dog does respond and behave. And it is what, what I want out of the dog. Okay, so without the science, I don't want you to have science, but you, you like in your own words, do you think you can explain it? I just explained it the best I could. You're not, you're, you're not. I, I don't know what else to, to tell you. I'm telling you by what the dog tells us. And I've never seen a dog that when it's prepared like this, and I'm not the only one doing this. Okay, so, so the, the, these are defense mechanisms that we, we gotta try to stay away from. Uh, I, it's not that you're the only one, I don't say that. I'm not saying it's working or it's not working. I'm not saying that I need science for it. I'm just saying that if you go in a shower and you have used the water on a program, you have one of those really fancy showers that as you walk in, it measures your temperature and immediately it starts putting exact same temperature you're on a neutral level. One day you walk in the shower and the water's hot. How did that neutral prepare you for the hot water or did it? 
Well, at that point, I know damn well what it is. I know it's hot water. <laughs> That's not the question I ask. I ask you, I'm asking you how the temperature of the water that's identical to your body temperature, and you use that for four months, prepared you not to freak out or, or whatever it is to, to deal with the hot water that came from the shower today. It doesn't. Thank you. It's not so hard. It's not hard to say it doesn't. It really doesn't. It does not. This is not a scientific question. This is a very, a, a very common logical question answer could, could, all right could i add could i ask you a question on that same thing sure why do we see so many dogs that completely get shut down when they're hit with an aversive from an e-collar right off the bat um because they got their minds blown off probably i mean there's many reasons who knows um but it's not a but we all see them you see them, I see them, right? We all, we always, we always see them. Uh, yes, yes, yes. And, and we started our conversation with the, the prerequisite that from, from what I got from the conversation is that in some ways, the way you use the electric collar and the way you go through that conditioning phase and the way you work with low steam is a better approach to use the electric collar than just frying the dog and, and letting him blow it, it's his anal glands every single time. Sure. I'm giving you that. There's no problem. But for right now, can we agree that the preparation that you just described, all that conditioning, did not prepare the dog for that event? I No, I can't agree with that. Explain. I can't. We, but, but don't give me an example of, well, I did it with that dog and that dog responds correctly and many trainers do it. This is, this is I, I, I'm not interested in this kind of conversation. Yeah, no, 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 no problems there. I just, because I can't help but compare it to the way we used to do things. Okay, but Larry, that's not the question. Well, I can't answer it any other way. I can't answer it any other way. Does examples of horrible frying dogs with electric collars are bad idea. We don't need to, we not, absolutely from this point on, we don't need to bring them on. I agree with that. And I ag agree that that's your, this approach with the, you know, with the book and everything is the, uh, um, the answer, uh, an attempt to do better than that kind of brutal approach. I give you that too. But I still have to ask that question and you cannot avoid it by saying, well, they're doing it in a very horrible way or hold on, or many trainers do it and it's, it works and I have success. This is, I also, let's say I'll give you that too. I wouldn't question your success how that conditioning of teaching the dog, hey, don't worry, that doesn't mean nothing good, nothing bad, that's neutral. How did that prepare him when the electric collar all of a sudden became aversive? I just wouldn't be comfortable doing it without. No, Larry, that's, I'm not asking, are you comfortable doing it with or without? I'm asking you how the preparation, that extensive foundation of conditioning to low steam prepared him. I mean, it's a simple question. Yes. And, 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 and I'm answering it for you. The dog knows how to turn it off. I will answer it to you. I, I will answer it. It did not prepare him whatsoever. It, it really did not. That's, that's the answer. And it's okay answer. It's not a, it's just what it is. It's not a, it's not like I'm going to take you somewhere else. It's just, that's the answer. Like he will respond to the version one way or another. And depending on the intensity, he will respond in a very different way. 
depending in what's at stake also, he will respond in a very different way. There is always pros and cons. There is always cost and benefit for everything, right? So nevertheless, all that conditioning, telling him that that's neutral, did not prepare him. In fact, when you used for the first time now, after all that prep, as an aversion, you surprised him. He, he, if you did that to me, or if I did that to you, you will turn and you'll be, Ivan, what the fuck was that? And it, it would be a very normal response because basically I would be like, Larry, you just lied to me for three months. That, that doesn't mean nothing. That's, I don't need to even whatever. And all of a sudden, well, why? How did you prepare me for that? I can't, I don't agree with that. Give, give me, give me something back. If you're going to use it that way right off the bat, okay, without using anything before, without introducing it at lower levels, how do you know how the dog's going to respond to it? I, I don't like the, I, I don't like how you answer me. Uh, uh, apologies for, for being direct like this, but you, you're asking a question. You're not answering what I'm asking you. you. You're refusing to say that that preparation has no effect. Because I don't believe in, I don't believe that. If I did, I would tell you. So then, then you have to explain how, how did that work? I thought I did that. No, you did not. If you did, I would, we will be moving on to the next thing. There is so much to talk about, but, but if you can, if you are not, uh, you know, like if, again, I have electric collar on, you use it. I'm like, yeah, I feel something. It's not bad. Definitely not bad. Definitely not good. I don't know why we're, but it's there. You go out of the way to tell me that this is not going to do nothing. And then it does. And you've done all that conditioning. I mean, that's an extensive time that you put, correct? Sure. That's extensive time. There is a, a clear purpose mm -hmm. and the purpose. That's why it's called conditioning. That's why it's all this low level and whatever. It's to prepare me for when it's uncomfortable. But I don't know that it's uncomfortable until you all of a sudden surprise the hell out of me. Because throughout that time, it was not that. How do you do it? That's, uh, I'll, I'll definitely tell you, I need the answer. I, it, does that mean that you agree with me now? I don't, I, okay. I, I won't, I, I won't be able to agree with that, Ivan, because, because of all the dogs that we've worked with that tell us different. Okay. So th the dogs that come to myself or someone who trains similar, let me, let me stop here. Everybody that trains dogs, that has a little bit of passion and a heart, and it does, it's not brutal, can teach and accomplish things with pet dogs. And the pet owner will be ecstatic every single time. In fact, it's one of the the, the highs the dog trainers get, it's not so much the money, but it's that feel of, of contribution and accomplishment and that ultimate praise like, man, you're, you have no idea how much you helped me, you're Jesus. I cannot believe my dog does that. I'm not taking that away from you, but that's easy. But those aren't the ones I'm talking about, Ivan. I'm talking about the dogs that have been fucking crucified with this tool. Sure, sure, sure. And, and you were successful still. 
just because you are successful and just because everybody's doing it i still like like when you when i ask you that like really very clear and simple question that 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 it's not hard thing and you're telling me stories and how trainers and how you're successful i am not challenging that what i'm challenging is not if you're successful with it i'm asking how your conditioning that you spent that time prepared the dog for that moment when you said place and you used discomfort on the electric collar how did that how how the two come together how does that make sense to the dog and how how your conditioning helped him how when you say that something is white and i fight with you and i'm like damn it it's gray no it's gotta be gray and finally i accept that it's white and all of a sudden you i mean you spent three months to to convince me that it's white and i finally am like okay gary i think it's white and tomorrow all of a sudden you show me that it's blue that's what you're doing to the dog you're saying right you you're 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 showing him and teaching and taking extensive amount of time to convince him one thing neutral not that not that white not gray not black okay i guess i go with it it's white i'll remember that boom it's blue really I thought you taught me white. How did you prepare me by telling me white for the blue? It's like uh, if you're a boxer, right? First time I got in the ring to box, no one punched me in the face as hard as they could. I had to spend some time understanding what it took to get hit, what it felt like to get hit. If I would have got punched by someone much bigger than me as hard as I could day one, I'd never get back in the ring. It's going to freak me out. It's going to cause confusion. I think if we could spend the next two hours talking about this, I don't know how to explain it on my end any differently. I just don't. So so when you, like, I, I'll go with that boxing analogy too. So you go in the ring, did they, like, if they were to be petting you with the gloves, that would actually be pleasant. But it was neither pleasant or aversive, it was neutral. So somehow you got brushed by gloves here and there in the ring, and you're like, okay, whatever that is, it doesn't. And then you get punched. that did not prepare you did it i don't know like i said i can't I, i'm giving you the best answer i can from my point of view okay let's go on let's go on. um so the intermittent phase is basically when we start using aversive and we start going a little higher levels what determines the levels? The dog. The dog's response to things with real distractions. Okay. The intermittent phase is e collar reward, no collar, e collar no reward, no collar no reward. Practice everywhere. In your book, you're actually not referring that there is that change that just coming up now but we have to agree that that's an important change in fact in the book you're saying that the e collar all you're doing with you're completely mix matching to where the dog is like i can do it with i can do it without i can do it only with that but 
it still seems to be neutral. But let's say maybe it's in the higher intermittent stage that you start using an aversion. Sure. And now let's say, let's say we're talking in, in the book where there is a E. coli and aggression. And we say, you, you, you say, I do not correct or punish the aggression with E. coli, uh, at least not to the, not on the front end. That's correct? Yes. Yes. Okay. Because I've seen it in, in the YouTube videos, including seminars where, where you do. I've done that one time in a seminar, and I explained to people why I did it. Okay. One time. Okay. And so that comes up and... If you watch that, I tell people, this is something I preach against all the time. I thought at that moment with that dog, it was the best thing to do. And it was, it okay. was. Fearful dogs. Now on fearful dogs, you're saying that, uh, you know, uh, 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 that, that works wonders, but you don't really know why, but trust me, it does. Uh, I. I find it very dangerous. Just as we talk about those trainers that, uh, um, you know, overuse and go on high levels and the dogs shit themselves and all that. And we disagree with that. I, I see just like really five sentences here, e color training for fearful dogs and basically saying that it works wonders and you don't know exactly why, but it does. And you don't say anything more. And there is fear of, of there's so many different variations that need to happen. I, I personally find this actually just as dangerous and, and irresponsible to, to say in a book like that and throw it there and say, hey, it works great. I don't know how it does but go ahead and do it on your dog that's afraid of shit. Well, that's not exactly what I was saying. I understand where you're coming from on, on that end, but it's just, I didn't put a lot in there on that because I don't do anything different. But I have seen a tremendous change in dogs that really struggle with anxiety and fear over and over again for a really long time. And so for me to go into more details, I'd be making shit up. I couldn't tell you why. I couldn't tell you exactly why. I just know that it does benefit fearful dogs quite a bit. Right. That's, that's so, so dangerous. This is just such a, such a dangerous advice. I, I'm, I'm sure right now you, I mean, even if you don't want to admit it, I, I'm sure you, you see it just because I'm kind of pointing it this way. Um, you know, th those are the dogs that just basically need help. And it doesn't like, it does not by no means, I'm not saying do never use electric collar on fearful dogs, but to say that it works wonders and that you don't know why, how about finding out what the fear is and try to work with the fear? And, and if you cannot go to somebody that knows, because obviously there is some demons that the dog is dealing with. So if he's disobeying place and you, we are using a version to go to place, there is no wonders in that way. This is, a, this is very misleading. And, and like, if I don't know nothing and I get a book that says many trainers and there is many success and it works wonder. We don't know why, but trust me. And so the dog now is afraid of lightning 
and there is that person on top of the lightning, starting on working level, conditioning, and eventually reaching a level of aversion, completely fucking the dog up in a very nice prolonged way. Well, obviously, Ivan, of course, that's never my intention. Of course, I know. Absolutely agree. Absolutely agree. And that's why there wasn't a, hey, this is how you do it. I was just giving my opinion on what it does. That's why I didn't go any further in that. Right, right, right. But you you see how I critique it in, in, in I, I, you know, in a way that I think we, we need to be careful. Sure. We have to be careful, especially if we are saying, hey, you guys are doing wrong, shitty things. And, and you know, like th that's a very, this is like the prescription that the snake oil doctor is gonna just, yeah, just pay me and, and you get the prescription. Um, now, when we talk about what, uh, the, like, like uh, the question and answers there, I, I want to just kind of touch base real quick on those. What do I do if the dog won't leave my side while conditioning? And where's the answer is going around. Many dogs will do this. We call this a Velcro dog. It's not a problem. You do not need the dog to be far away to start conditioning with recall. And it goes a little further. The problem I have with this is first, if the dog is Velcro to you, he is showing insecureness. He's saying, I'm gonna stay next to you because if I go away, things are happening. I don't want things to happen. Somehow I found at least that spot that's safety. Mm -hmm. I think that's very important when, when this question is presented. What do I do when the dog won't leave my side while conditioning? Instead of saying many dogs will do this and saying that's called Velcro dog and that it's not a problem, to actually explain that Things went a little bit too fast, too soon. The dog is unsure and is looking for help. Is, is, would you say that's what the Velcro dog does? Sure, sure, absolutely. Right. Okay, good. Another question, can I stop unwanted behavior? Absolutely where many go wrong is that they just put the collar and, and go high. But if you condition it properly first, then the dog is trained to the collar. So then he will stop the unwanted behavior as a, in, is a breeze. And there is no easier way. So that one, we cannot really debate because I couldn't get you to agree with me that all that conditioning that you do didn't prepare the dog for aversion. Like you refuse to say that. So we leave that alone. At what age do you start, start the e-collar training? I prefer the dog to be seven or eight months. What, uh, what do you see in there? Like what is the, like in ideal world, what is the seven, eight months? What Give me, give me something. I just like there to be a little bit of maturity and the dog to have a strong foundation with obedience. Okay. You okay. know, I'm not a, not, not a fan of someone putting e-collars on puppies, but that's, again, that's just me. But if you're going to use the e-collar the way you describe it, something neutral, what would a puppy care? It, because I, I still think the puppy should be built up, should have a foundation. Right, right. But you're building them up, right? Because it's easier to mess up a puppy. Very okay, easy. Okay, but, but so again, the question that I have is, you, uh, you, why would it be dangerous since we are not using it as a version? We're talking the main, the, the foundation, the conditioning phase where 
you do that little tap and it doesn't mean nothing. So what there is zero danger. There is zero nothing. There you is probably zero nothing. And, and you'd probably be fine. It's just not my thing. Not right. what I do. That that's kind of what I wanted to, to get to. When this is a different question. When and how much should I dial up levels when the dog is not responding well off leash? Your answer is I don't dial up levels. I always have the collar set on appropriate level for the situation. That's a, another very misleading and, and I would say dangerous uh, uh, answer. And I'll explain why. My motivation level to do or not do something will change according how bad I want it. So if I decide that I'm gonna do something and the benefits are really, really worth it to me, I, I will go for it. And you will have a level that you have prepared for me for me, let's say, let's say I have a drink here and I'm like gonna reach to get the drink and you tap me on that preset level that typically I respond, which is level 50. It's definitely discomfort. But in two minutes later, I see some really hot chip. And I'm like, I don't need to have a podcast with you. I don't need to do nothing else. I'm going out. And you give me that level 50. I'll take it. I have no problems taking it. Correct? Mm -hmm. So when we, when, when we are saying when and how much should I dial up levels since not, you know, and the answers of I don't dial levels the, like the actual answer should be the, the, the stimulation has to out, outweigh the desire to continue. And that is what I teach. Okay. So let me reiterate that if I didn't go enough in there. But that's not, that, that's not in the book, Larry. Okay. If, if I have a client that's going to take their dog to the park, okay. If I have a German short hair pointer that's going to the park and he's going to be off leash, off leash, then that client understands that that dog's going to be extremely motivated to get to animals and birds and chase things. They're not going with that set. That e collar has to be set at an appropriate level to stop the highest level distraction that that dog, dog's going to be. I'll stop you here. The collar does not have to be set. The co that's the beauty of the collar. The collar has to respond. The dog outweighs his options. Sure. Benefits and costs, pros and cons. Right. When we have, like when I have workshops here or when I have like my graduation, which you will have a lot of fun in, I promise you. We, we play games. We go in the, the room where we teach and we train we put $20 at the end of the room and anybody that wants to play, we will put electric collar on them. And if they can get the money, it's their money. And we go, it's kind of, we call it hunger, the hunger games. And we go on and the price keeps going higher, but we also put two collars, four collars on the legs. We've ended up putting collar on the neck as well. So it's five colors, but there is $800 there. And I have videos of people and not just guys that go and take the money. There is a, I will give you a very, very cool, which again, this is something that uh, uh, we're gonna, we, we go into a great detail during the, the school. But it's an interesting, very, it's a super interesting study, experiment. 
with people, healthy people, volunteers, prior to putting them in a, in a, uh, like the idea is they, they put them in a isolation kind of dark room, nothing there, like nothing. And they gotta stay 15, 20 minutes there. And they have a, before they go in there, they say, hey, there is that little box, by the way, that if you push it, it will, it will get a little electric steam. Would you do it? Many people said, no, why would I fucking do that? Then they went further to say, well, you know what? We're gonna give you $50 for every time you do it or $5 or whatever. They, they're gonna actually pay them to do it. Would you do it? And they said, no. Then they went in and the majority actually did it. And a lot of them did it repetitively. The, the reason I'm bringing this up is because motivation to do or not do something is what dictates what you do with the color. Sure, and I agree with so that. So when, when you say, I don't dial up levels, I always have the color set on the appropriate level for the situation. You cannot possibly know what I think, like what is my level of motivation at that moment that you already can say, I have preset, I know what Ivan's gonna do. I know I'm gonna stop him on 60. There's no way. You, the only logical and, and reasonable ways to go along with what the dog does and you act accordingly. Or to have it set higher <laughs> than needed possibly. Why? I mean, I mean, it's an option, but it's not a, but you're, you, you, you got my point here, right? Sure. Okay. Yeah. All right. Yeah. We, I'm not disagreeing with that. Okay. We move on. Can I use the e-collar to correct reactivity towards other dogs when out on a walk? Absolutely. If you condition the dog pro properly and teach like I have talked about, this is an easy fix once the dog is conditioned and that does not take long. Now, again, my problem with this is that Going back to the I still don't know <laughs> your conditioning. I, I can argue with the whole world that that conditioning did not help with the introduction, with the aversion. My dog looks depressed since my trainer started using e collar Is this normal? So that question kind of refers to the, the shitty training and then going back to a lower levels and so on, which is okay. But just because we are going to, from a really stupid high level training, and now we are on all, on all levels and it's working, there is zero guarantee. In fact, it will be a very wild guess how the dog's gonna respond when it reaches that level of motivation that says I'm going through and you have to use the level that the dog needed. I, I, I will give you some, uh, um, like there, there's, you know, uh, I mean, again, I, I will never say this doesn't work. I'm saying what I'm saying, I'm trying to find logic. And I believe, this is my personal belief, that the force free, that whole tribe, that ideology, their narrative actually, trainers that use this slow, low conditioning, help them fight against people owning electric colors. And the reason for that is because it's overused, it's presented in a way that, I mean, I've, you know, anyone that can use their brain understands that it's not true, but it, there is that 
sugar coating of, of what it means and what it does, there is no one positive trainer that will fail for that. There is no, the, all the scientific studies will not, uh, um, you know, just because we are saying this, we are not going to the extreme high levels, but we are overusing it. And we, all that we are not preparing, we are not doing much good. That there is, even in the force free camp, there is an extremist. Just like whatever the thing is with balance trainer, which I don't want to even go there. But, but the average person that doesn't like electric colors, they, uh, um, it's the it's the that kind of explanations that it's like, oh yeah, it doesn't, it doesn't, and not. But then it does. There was a studies. Arzin and Holtz. These are like the old school studies where, you know, you had the rat and a maze and you could do pretty much anything you wanted to. Um, I mean, you still could with some, in some situation, but anyway, what I'm gonna give you as an example is a very, very cool experiment. What they did was they, they put a cheese at the end of the maze. Of course, there is the rat, there is the end of the maze, the finds its way to the cheese, it's the cheese. But it also has a little plate, metal plate, that actually runs electricity. So they start to see what would it take to stop the rat from continuing to go to the cheese. The beauty of the electric color is or, or anything with electric experiments is because it's super easy to control and manipulate levels to the, 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 the minicule levels that we need to consistently, right? So they start on a super low level. They start on a level where the rat, let's say, goes on the plate and it stops there and it's like, do I feel something? No, and goes and gets the cheese. Then they increase the level, but they increase by a little bit. It goes, it gets the cheese. They continue to increase the level. The rat continues to go and get the cheese. Eventually, there is a break point, right? This is where the neutral becomes unpleasant. The rat is like, okay, I've been getting my cheese all the time. I, I feel it a little different, but I'm going. Goes and gets the cheese. Level continues to increase. Of course, this is not just in one session. I mean, it's a, you know, a, a, a thing that they've done with plenty of rats and, and uh, you know. It reaches a level that the rat is clearly in great deal of discomfort. I mean, it's trying to jump it, it's trying, it's actually screaming, it's, it's there. You now the level is not cool no more. It keeps going. And the reason it keeps going is because we have conditioned it that they can, that they can actually overcome it. And even though physically, it's like, fuck. But the mind is like, you can do it. Sure enough, a high enough level is reached that the rat says, you know what, thank you. That's, that's madness. No more cheese for me. So maybe that level was from one to 180. Then they bring a very clean slate, never, never had anything, no, no, no conditioning. And instead of going from level one and two and three, they just go level 25. Enough that it's not unpleasant. It's not, I'm gonna die, but it's like, man, that's fucked up. It's clear discomfort. And on a single try, 
The rat says, thank you. I don't need the cheese. So the gist of that story is that we, a lot of times, can do far more damage in terms that we will need much higher level than what we need if we do certain things. And we can argue that, well, but it's still level 20, it's not that high. My argument is that if we didn't do that prelim work, we can do it on 10. You know what the problem with that is, Ivan? Yeah. When we talk about something being dangerous, what you say has a lot of power, right? In the dog world. So think about how many people are going to go back out, put the e-collar on their dog that shouldn't be training dogs, like you said earlier, and going right back to high levels from the start, like the whole damn dog world failed 20 years ago. That's what, that's what they're going to do. So my whole purpose was to get people to stop doing that. That was it, to stop doing that. What I, I, I see what you're saying, and, and here is the, the, the problem with what you're saying. What I'm suggesting is actually far less, like far less use of electric collar in the dog's life like far less. And also, when you use it, you and, and be effective, if you use it to suppress some undesired whatever, assuming you've done all the rest, differential reinforcement, whatever, whatever, everything else, but it's time to actually use a version, that a version will re not require the level that you will use. Therefore, when, when there is education, when we don't write books and say, oh, I don't know how it works, but it does. But we actually teach each other. We have this kind of conversation like right now. This is a, a, a super cool conversation. And we can have that same conversation with the force-free ideology people. Nobody can argue with certain things. I, like you, you will see in my class, I start with a, a very fundamental biological programming that everybody, the single cell organism, anything living in our planet is programmed to approach something good and to avoid something bad. This is where everything starts. I including even if you, if you have food that you like, even if you don't think you're kind of draw into it and there is something that you don't like and you like trying not to using a version there is no like this is what it's called uh, 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 it's innate it's biologically programmed it's in our DNA for the billions of years from whenever that very first cell became a life being from design God, evolution, whatever it was. But it's in our programming. We understand it very good. Like this is the most simple thing that everybody, we don't need our human high level brain. This is a, we are biologically programmed to respond. So it's not a, it's not a something out of this world that's happening. There, is a, there, there are many studies that show that with prior exposure to electric stimulation, the, the subject that are, have experienced it, they, can, they become much more tolerable, like at least twice more tolerable. We, we can talk about habituation, you know, getting used to. As, as I started the, the, I don't know, but I, I believe I talked about it a little bit, but like learning, learning one of the really cool definitions of like in, in um, 
I, it, it was, uh, what's his name? John Staden. Like I, I have a really cool podcast with him if you haven't checked it out, cause it's really, he says, learning is initiated by violation of expectation, a surprise. The more we create a habituation, even when like um, there, there is again a whole different topic of how dopamine and how we activate and, and all that. And, but we, we are not there to even talk about that. Um, dopamine gets controlled. Dopamine, there is a dopamine crash. Dopamine also gets habituated. It's not always the way we think about it. it do, dopamine, it doesn't really go, go always in, in that, that sense. Um, so habituation to the aversive is less likely to occur with limited or infrequent exposure to whatever that aversion is. That's, there's no questions about this. And we can make wonders when we use it correctly in that sense. Like we will be highly effective. And I will tell you something. Switzerland is one of the really, they, they started the whole thing. I mean, everything started in early 2000s with this uh, study in, in um, Holland, but that, that's when they started to promote the banning. And, and again, we, we talk about this a lot, a lot in this class, but Switzerland really took it they were the first country that took it to a completely different level to where you, your dogs are taken, you are not allowed to have dogs, you will go to jail, you will have a fine, like this is a big, big crime. However, they have their chosen few that still can use the e collar The problem with that, of course, is it doesn't, you know, like somebody from one side of the country schedules an appointment and goes one time. It's effective to some extent because of what I just said with that habituation and, and, and the prior exposure and all that. But of course, if they had a better opportunity and, and do the things that they need to do in their own environment instead of driving for five hours on the other end of the country. But the, w my point is that ultimately, not the, not the scientists that just f are starving and need to get paid for something and keep repeating the same experiments and just try to put this bullshit where re positive reinforcement is the solution to the world. Everybody knows that it's not. If it was, I will go and pay the money and learn it. If it was, you will go and pay the money and learn it. There is, everybody wants to do better. If their shit worked, we will jump on it, but it doesn't. And if it did, they will not have that. So ultimately, if we have the correct, like, like if we're not bullshitting each other, if we actually talk the talk that needs to be talked, we have much higher chance to defend the color because ultimately a true scientist cannot argue that that's how biologically we work. If, if the, the narrative of the force free worked, we will not have police, we will not have, uh, uh, you know, I mean, you know, you, you've been in that uh, type of work, like we will be just good people. No, something needs to keep us on track. It's just the nature, how we are programmed. And scientists know that. And in fact, they know something, but we know more in some ways because our lab is every day doing things with a lot of dogs. All they're doing in there is they have five dogs and they will make a conclusion according to those five dogs. And their conclusion will be based on not even understanding training concepts. So, but uh, um, 
that that's that's another one I, I i will give you one more and then and then i'll i'll have you this one is a very interesting uh just just another reason why and I can go on with more, but this, like this few, hopefully it makes sense. And everybody, it's not just for you. This, I, I hope that, you know, every time people are like, oh, you're only talking like this, but you never educate, you never tell us. It's like, no, I, I can tell you. There was a, a, a really cool one. Um, what was the name? Hall, Hall and Pierce. It's like 1978 or 80 or something like that. So they would have a, the dog, there is three dogs. Like it's, it's easy, but it, it can look confusing, but there are three dogs. So, the, so they teach them to uh, um, press lever, you know, I mean, it's just classical experience. They're in a box and they're pressing something and whatever. The one dog is presented with a tone, something and a low stimulation. Another dog is presented instead of a tone with a light and a low stimulation. And the third dog was presented only with a tone, no stimulation, right? That's like the first phase of the, the experiment. So they do it long enough to where it's like, okay, tone, weak shock means something. Tone only means something. Light and weak shock means something they drill it enough to where it's paired it's conditioned the dog understands okay there's consequences right now they present them with a instead of the low steam with a higher level of aversion the it's actual strong strong level right and everybody gets it all three of them in that phase of course, all three learn something. There is no question about that. I mean, it's a, you know, things have changed, right? But the, the actual question was which group can learn faster to suppress the level of pressing in the presence of tone only so there is no electric anymore and the group that had the, this is like the, the cool thing the the uh, um if you wanted you know it's almost like a puzzle at first or at least it was for the scientists when they did it because when you think about it the dog that had the tone and the weak stem, he was introduced to both already. Then we changed it to the higher level. But ultimately, that was the dog that learned. He did learn, but it learned the slower of the other two. The one that had light and tone, I mean, light and low stem, still learned faster than the one that already had steam and tone. The one that had only tone, but no steam whatsoever, also learned faster than that one. It's a very interesting, like that there's like quite a few studies like this that come, um, that show how, how we respond. Again, again, like, a, you know, when you, when you don't have a narrative and you're not one of those, uh, what do you call them, the cognition labs, and they, they really have agenda. No, positive reinforcement is the solution for everything. And it's just like, it, come on, like it's, it's, just, it's exhausting. Let's have a conversation for a change. We can all benefit because if we don't have that conversation, everybody's hiding. You can see what happens in Europe. They, people get threatened, they're filming them hiding. Like luckily we're living in a country where this kind of stuff hopefully never is possible. But still, I, I think that we, we, we really need to have this kind of conversations and we need to discuss. And 
it would have been so easy for me to just be like, yeah, it's okay. But if sometimes somebody doesn't think that it's okay and have an opinion, I think that's how we change. That's how we evolve. That's how everybody gets stimulated and starts to think about it. And I don't think it's wrong. <clears throat> sure. And, and like we talked earlier, when we talked privately, I had nothing to gain from this conversation, nothing, but no one else wants to have it. Correct. Okay. No one wants to have it. So I stepped up and said, I'd have it because Cats off to that, like sincerely two main kinds of people that are going to be excited to watch this people that want to see you go after me 100% guarantee it because especially your people a lot of people that are real tight with you they love that they hate me they want to see you tear me down and then there's going to be a lot of people that want to see what you do and if I don't ask you they're going to be very disappointed so they want to know what do you do? Okay, if this way is not the best way, what is the best way? They're going to listen to you. But we've never had that conversation. At least I've never seen it. You understand what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. So five years ago, before mm -hmm. I write that book and trying to change people's perception of the tool, if you call me and say, hey, I see this book. I don't agree with it. I think you should try this. You know what I'm going to do? I'm going to try it. I'm going to try it a hundred percent because that's what I do. That's what I do. So of course, here is the thing with, there is a, a one of like really, and hopefully I, I don't but butcher the quote right now, but uh, it's this astrophysic Neil deGrasse Tyson. Oh yeah. I know what you're, I know what you're going to say. Help me. I know exactly. How that, did that the, go? The quote. You know enough to think that you're right but you don't know enough to know that you're wrong. And I think we are all there. I am, I am I, like never in my life will ever claim that I am the authority of anything. As I said, if I know anything that's of interest that even, even if slightly I believe that I can have a some some mind stimulation that's gonna you know challenge me or or help me get better i'm right there i'm student for life absolutely keeping that beginner's mind there is no question but you know ivan like it, your other podcasts that you mentioned right with the academic people they're 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 phenomenal filled with amazing information but the problem is most dog trainers are going to listen to that and be excited and try to understand it, but it's not going to help them in the application. They need to hear things that's going to help them in the application of the dog training. And so when you tell me, I don't agree with this, I don't agree with this, I totally understand that, but right. they want to know from you, what would you do different? That's what oh, they're going to want to know. Right. So you know you're gonna know everything that I teach. Like there will be no stone uncovered, unturned. I share everything, including like if I, if I come up with something and I have played long enough and I know it's working or I read something completely new, which I, this is all I do all of the time. Right in the middle of a, class, I will change modules, I will delete information and I will be like, this is wrong. There is another one with, with Einstein, like a super cool quote, like he was teaching at uh, whatever the university he was at. And one of his helper students, you know, graduates, like preparing the material and he's like, you know, uh, Dr. Einstein, this is exactly the same stuff that we did last year. Why would we do that? And his reply was, things have changed. We need to revisit. Things have changed. Things change all the time, you know? And, and me telling how I do things 
on social media or on a podcast who who is a professional dog trainer i'm saying professional dog trainer that teaches dogs for free and why would you i mean sometimes i trust i mean i give plenty of advice plenty of advice like like plenty of advice we, i i can be in the middle of a competition and i have five of the top competitors that are against me will ask me a question about how would you do this and i will just go this and this and this but at the same time i have spent about 20 years of serious work to create that program and I think you and I understand that not not everything is it's just you know like like really what what would you want me to do it's not that I don't share it's absolutely not true right i mean you're coming you're coming you sure. will know you will know you know and it's not that i again i i here and there i i give examples i give ideas i i throw things but i i cannot like with this specific thing my answer and you will have opportunity we're going to discuss this i would i would enjoy like i we're going to have amazing time when we when we do the the course like i promise you it's going to be amazing like i've told you i will i will completely triple refund you if you don't think that but like the actual electric collar to me there is nothing voodoo there is nothing magic what is really the mastery and the skill and the understanding is knowing genetics knowing when nurture when nature has the say like again i'll give you another example because dog trainers are stuck in behaviorism which is so outdated like in that purest pure Skinnerian form where Skinner said, oh, punishment doesn't fucking work. And the other one said, oh, give me Watson, give me anybody newborn and I'm gonna make him whatever I want through reinforcement and punishment. We know this doesn't work. We know in the 80s what they were doing to the uh, gay community trying to it's just stupid shit. We know better, but dog trainers are stuck there still. And when we have, like in the 60s, his name was John Garcia. He made a super cool study. The behavior is, they hated him. They did not let him publish this because that was one of the moments when that whole thing started to crumble. And, and real quick, this is the experiment, and I'll tell you why is it so important, because using the electric to me is the easiest thing. We need to know what ticks and how and why. So he decided to do an experiment. He, he rats, of course. He feeds them some food, specific food, but then later they give them a little drop in the water, some radioactive thing, just enough to make them puke and get sick nothing more the rats just like us it's proven it's it's in the the books condition and and they learn how to they're like okay i don't do that no more i know exactly that food is not good for me i mean that's why you know like you we can be at the indian restaurant and we can do whatever but the next day even at the night and we start having stomach upsets and you're like man that i know exactly why but our brain is programmed it's designed through all that evolution to catch that it's of our best interest 
So he takes that experiment in a whole different level. He's like, how about I give him that food, but instead of putting some drops of radioactive and make him sink from inside, how about I just, as they're eating, I start flashing lights and make bang noises and whatever and scare the shit out of them and see if they will stop eating the food just as they did before. And of course they didn't. They were sure afraid, they sure stopped eating, they sure checked out immediately, but we are, they are not biologically programmed to connect. This is a completely different department in the brain that gets stimulated. And so that was a, a, a really big deal because when we're talking about, oh, we can just reinforce everything. No, you cannot. The, the scientific literature is endless. Like any evolutionary biology uh, paper can just blow their minds. It's, it's ridiculous to, to you know, um, talk like that. So understanding genetics is a big deal. Understanding how reinforcement, what you can reinforce, what you cannot reinforce, how to punish, what to punish, what is the level of motivation, what is emotions, how emotions come up, what is the dopamine and how much, all this stuff is what the answer really lays into. It's not about what level you use the control on. And I agree, I agree 100% with that. 100%, I don't disagree with that. And please, like for everybody that listens, like I absolutely, I mean, very sincerely hats off for taking that challenge because you fucking knew that I'm not gonna back sure. off. Mm -hmm. And I believe that the conversation that we just had, like you should be applauded because what you did for everybody, you made me t talk and, and, and give ideas that typically I wouldn't. And I think people should be very thankful to you for that. Like really, I, I believe that from, from the bottom of my heart. I'm not scared to have a conversation that doesn't go my way. I knew this wasn't, but it has to be done. It's got to be done. That's all there is to it. You know? And, and whenever the time comes, and trust me, it will, I, I will have a fucked up idea. Please tell me somebody. I mean, they, like in the, you know how the whole thing went. I mean, you know how it went. The social media sucks in some ways because it's a, no matter how you say something, ultimately it just goes like this. Let's see that fight. It's like, fuck you. It, it's okay. Maybe I said it to whatever I was in the moment. It's unforgiving. It's, it's really crazy. And we don't learn this way. And we don't, whenever we have the opportunity to talk in person, like I've talked to you before, I talk to you now, I will talk to you after. I always were gonna have super cool conversation with you. I talk with pretty much all the people that the, the you know, everybody that was typing was trying to put them on the spot. Oh, you should have with this one, with this one. I talk with these people all the time. We, we have conversation. We don't agree on certain things. But how would I not respect somebody that has put his life in dog training? He has his heart there. It, I don't know. I don't know. It's human nature sometimes. It's just crazy. But yeah, I am tired. I don't know how are you. I, how long we've been doing this? What what time is it? Two hours and thirty five minutes. Fuck. How are you doing? Yeah, it's a long time. No, I'm I'm <laughs> I'm, I'm fine. I knew I knew you were going to ask a lot of questions that I couldn't answer or didn't agree with what you on your side of it. But like I said, I'm, I'm always willing to do that. 
you know. Uh, and it's not right or wrong. I mean, you ultimately, everybody sits on it and thinks it and, and takes what, what you want to take and what you think it's helpful to you. Like there, I, for sure there is something that everybody can take away from this and that's already amazing. Oh, there, there'll be so much confusion over this conversation. You know, they'll won't know what to do. They'll want to know more. They'll be asking more questions, but, but we cannot do it. This is the danger of social media. And I wish we can do like in the matrix, you, you lay down and get plugged in. And two minutes later, you learned Kung Fu. Well, this fuck, I would do it. Well, uh, it's just, it's, it's gotta be done. But that's where we are with it. Like, like today, I think our minds are just, we cannot stay focused on, on one thing for like ridiculous amount of time. And, and everything needs to be in, presented in some sensation. Everything is like, we gotta read books and we don't read books to learn and, and especially now, I mean, you have Kindle, you have audiobooks, you, you have so many ways just as you're driving instead of listening to some, I don't, I, I, again, I don't want to say that all podcasts are stupid, but you gotta, like, everybody has to kind of use their brains and there, there is main, there's a lot of information out there that we can learn, you know, it's there. But Ivan, there's not a lot of information on what we're discussing today. There's just not, you know, when it comes to the e-collar stuff, there's not a lot of information, not factual information. It's all the same stuff, you know, it's, yeah. it's all the same stuff. Here's the before, here's the after right. video. Yeah, I, it's horrible, horrible. That's not beneficial to anyone. It's just not. It's it's some for some reason we are in a we are in a competition. How long? How how much faster I can train the dog than you? Yeah. You cannot. I cannot. Like, and why would we put the dog under that torture to just flood him with all this shit in a week or two? And even if we do, what do they retain? Something to be learned, you need to understand it. Then you need to practice it. And then you need to stay long enough to where you actually create a healthy new habit. But somehow those places, oh, I, I can do it for this short term time. It's like, no, you're doing nothing. You're just blowing the dog's brain for no reason. Right. It's so wrong. Yep. It's so wrong. It is. I agree. But hopefully we continue. And and there is always gonna be good and bad though. It's, it's just, I all I want is, and this is why I keep bringing, uh, and I have like, I, I have really cool, I think three podcasts that are ready, but somehow we got stuck in this. And you know, like if we didn't do this, everybody would be pissed. Everybody on social media can put each other in this conflicting and animosity, but the more, even when we hate something and we disagree on something, the more we actually meet in person and have conversation, we realize that we all have the same, I mean, at least the people I talk to we have the same interest. We have the best interest of the dog, the best interest of the family. We, we want to have our rights. We want to do better and we want to improve. And then we find ways. And if somebody says something stupid because of what you and I just did, go ahead, be the dumbass, do it, whatever. Well, there'll, there'll be, like I said, there'll be plenty of people that will try to crush me. I hope not. I hope not. Oh, there's always going to be. There will be plenty of people that don't like what you had to say. That's just part of it. You can't make everyone happy. Right. No. Right. Yeah. No, it's true. It's, it's, it's going to happen. Um, but it, 
if you still wanted to have this conversation, I had to do it. It's very much appreciated. And as I said, it was wonderful that we had a conversation and even the haters would benefit from the conversations. Yeah, yeah. And, and ultimately maybe dogs benefit and, and maybe the whole narrative of the force free ideology also realizes that we, we are actually trying, we want to do something. Of course, you know, always, so always, and we'll continue it in person. That's right. It's going to be awesome. I've, you see. All right, Ivan. Thank you again, like seriously. And, and if somehow I came too harsh to whatever apologies, it, it, hopefully we make a cool conversation, my friend. Not necessary. No, that's, that's what this is about. You can't be scared of, of the confrontation and the disagreement. You can't, you can't do it. That's not me. You know, I'll have a conversation with, with anyone always have. Thank you, man. 